الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباد الذين اصطفى أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما محمد إلا رسول قد خلت من قبل الرسل أفإن مات أو قتلا قلبتم على عقابكم ومن ينقلب على عقبه فلن يضر الله شيئا وسيجد الله الشاكرين صدق الله مولانا العظيم As you are aware that for the past three weeks approximately we are talking about the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and it's important that we talk about the life of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the things that you talk about most are generally the things that affect you the most so if you talk about cell phones all the time cars all the time then chances are that's what's affecting your life rent all the time, food all the time these are the things, the more you talk about them the more they affect you and they affect the outcome of how you live your life so therefore to be fair let's say for example I think I am very religious if that's what I think or I think I love my Allah a lot if I think and I purposely use the word I think if I think I love my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a lot then we have to ask ourselves a very fair question in the past 24 hours what was my conversation regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what was my conversation with my children regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah in the Quran himself says well, in kuntum Allah, that if you love Allah what's love? that's the question love is a very very deep word it's an attempt of a connection between you and something else well, in kuntum Allah, Allah is saying oh Muhammad sallallahu tells the people if you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then fattabi'uni then your lifestyle will show that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the lifestyle in as far as you name it you can use any example you wish to use eating, drinking, sleeping, walking, talking interacting etc all becomes under the umbrella of what is expected of me from my creator right now there is a lot of debate that goes on this time of year for example the debate is did Jesus Isa alayhi salam celebrate Christmas if you are a true Christian it's a question that you should be asking and by the way was there a fixed calendar back then did they follow the solar or the lunar calendar and if the answer is they follow the lunar calendar then we know Christmas cannot be every year on the 25th so while Muslims are bringing this point up regarding other religions and other people the question we have to ask ourselves also is I'm claiming to be a follower of a certain man keyword claiming keyword we claim you cannot make a claim if you don't have proof if I make a claim against you in the court of law I have to furnish proof I cannot just make a claim it's futile to make a claim and not bring proof thereafter that's why we have what is known as bring on the evidence so the evidence is and should be if I'm a follower of what Allah expects of me if I'm a follower of what the Prophet of Allah expects or if I'm a follower of him then there is something that is expected of me and to what extent am I fulfilling that criteria and agenda now that takes us to <coughs> we were talking about of course we spoke about the people of Saba and Allah in the Quran talks about the people of Saba who was Saba was it a man was it a people was it a land we covered all that now we came to that part of the Jurhum tribe so as far as the Jurhum tribe was concerned they were very powerful now we have to understand one thing <clears throat> you will notice as part of human nature that when we are at the start of anything we are always very humble at the start of anything we are very humble we are always very nice that's human nature like the Jurhum tribe they came there they were very humble in nature very soft in nature because they wanted water they wanted benefit and Hajra had access to the water and she said you know this is the Zamzam 
I would like to be in charge of it. But if you want to live here, by all means, you are more than welcome to live here. So they started living. And as they started living, they became very, very powerful. They became very, very strong. Their family got larger and larger, bigger and bigger, and more powerful and more powerful, and they began spreading throughout Makkah al Mukarramah to the various boundaries, etc. They may not have had guns back then, but they loved fighting with people. And Ismail السلام, was also married to the Jurhum tribe. And his first wife, there was a problem. That's why when Ibrahim السلام, came to Ismail السلام, to meet, when he met, he met his first wife. How are you? What are you like? She said, you know, yes, we get food. He's gone now to make money out there. He's gone to bring a livelihood for us. And that's a wonderful thing. Every man should do that. But at the same time, she complained and she says, I'm not very, very happy. I, I wish there was more of this and I wish there was more of that. And Ibrahim السلام, said something very important. He says, when your husband comes home, then tell him to change an aspect of the lock out there. Change the gate, change the attachment to the gate. This meant this woman is never going to be satisfied with you. Let her go and marry someone else. So, yes, when we say we are related to the Ismail, or when we say we related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we say we related to Hassan and Hussein, when we say we related to Junaid Baghdadi, whatever we say we related to, understand full well, you have to understand what you are saying. Because if you are living a life that is messed up, you are living a life of violence, a life of treachery, a life of evil, a life of wrong, and you're saying you link to so and so, and things don't add up, then you end up hurting yourself, and you hurt the image of Islam, and you hurt the image of the background that you are claiming to be part of. So now what did the Jurhum tribe do? Now they did many, many bad, bad things. See, in the beginning they were very humble and very good. But when they got power, then they started doing evil. Amongst the evil, they started taxing the hujjaj. So when people would come to make the pilgrimage, they would raise the taxes on them. And they would extort money out of them. Uh, some of them would do such haram things around the Kaabatullah, around it, that eventually, it comes in folklore, Arab folklore, that two people were turned into stones. Now we don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they say happened. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows a people to get away with wrong for a very long time. For some five years, for some ten years, for some fifty years, for some five hundred years, for some five thousand years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them get away with the corrupt act. One of the signs that a society is corrupt in nature, one of the signs is reduction in fruit, reduction in vegetation, primarily reduction in water. And they say that if you want water to be reduced, commit zina. And you notice our society, it is filled with zina in some capacity or the other. So when this continues, zina continues, barakah reduces itself, water goes down, this is exactly what happened. The zamzam well got dry. How did the zamzam well get dry? Because these people were committing every type of fitna and facade. Adultery was going on, robbing the hujjaj was going on, committing zulam on people was going on. And if you look at our global society right now, this is exactly what is happening. You know, people say we have an Islamic country and I come from a Muslim this and I come from a Muslim that. Look what's happening around the Ummah right now. The wealthy are getting wealthier, the poor are getting poorer, and the wealthy are snatching away the little bit even the poor have. And the consequence of that is what? Reduce baraka and reduce amount of water. That is why when we were growing up, have you ever heard of water being sold? I never heard of water being sold when I was a child. I think it's a pretty much a concept of probably that started maybe in the 90s, 80s, somewhere around there. And they started off at first avion water. I don't know if you remember avion water. The water that had a little bit of bubble. Now, water is being sold left and right. Water is the right of every human. 
we learn in religion water is the right of every human a human should not be paying for water again you come back to the story that we are talking about so reduction of zamzam took place eventually the zamzam well got dried up when it got dried up because of the fitna these people are taking part in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a man from the Khuza Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa says in the hadith Ra'aytu Amr ibn Amir al-Khuza'i radiyallahu ta'ala yajurru fi nar That I saw this given individual from the Khuza'i tribe He was in the depths of fire Now before he went into the depths of fire I want to talk about how shirk started He came to wipe out the Jurhum tribe The Jurhum tribe when they got angry What do we do when we get angry? As people, you know exactly. Again, we are talking about history, but we are also talking about how we are as people. When we get angry, what we do? We are going to teach him a lesson. We are going to get him. I am going to show him. Oh, he thinks a lot. I am going to wipe him out of the inheritance. He thinks a lot of himself. I am going to do this and I am going to... We will see who he comes to later on. This is human nature. This is exactly what the Jurham tribe did. All the treasures they had, all the good they had, instead of saying, you know what? Now you want to take over, take over and move on. What they did was, they took all that gold, all that pearls, all that jewelry, all, and they threw it in the well of Zamzam. Because the well of Zamzam was dry, there was nothing there, so they threw it inside over there. This man comes in, Amr ibn Amr, and he now takes over. He becomes the new man in charge. According to some, he got very sick. When he got very sick, he started traveling. He wanted cure. So he went to a place of Sham. Some say it was in that area he went. Don't quote me exactly. He went there and he went for his cure. And when he went there for his cure, he saw people worshipping idol. So he says, what's this you are worshipping? They said, you know, when we need water, we go to this idol and this idol gives us water. When we want food, we go to this idol and this idol gives us food. When we want children, we go to this idol and we get children. Whatever, when we want to fight someone, we go to this idol. We ask the idol to make us victorious and we win our wars. That's what they told him. He says, okay, no problem. Give me a small idol. This is how shirk starts. This is how shirk started and how it continues for many of us. We're just going to go to the grave and we'll just ask the man over there a little small favor. Anyway, he says, okay, fine. Wonderful, you all believe in all these big idols. Give me an idol from here. Give me an idol. And the idol's name was Hubul. So he bought Hubul, small idol, and he brought it with him all the way to Makkah al Mukarramah. He brought it there. And look at, at how shaitan, how experienced he is. So when he brought Hubul all the way to Makkah to Mukarramah, he didn't just say, here's an idol. He says, let's go near the Kaabatullah. See, mental games, playing games. And let's leave it near the Zamzam area. See again, Zamzam, using a very religious word. This is how shirk is. We use all the religious words around it to cover up our wrong. And thereafter he made a nice stand and he put it near the Zamzam area. And this is what he said. He says, this is a small God, don't worry. The small God is going to connect with the big God upstairs. So you talk to the small God, whatever you want, and the small God will talk to the big God. And that's how your du'as are going to get accepted. You see, we think we have cell phones. And you know, we have cell phone reception, this reception, that reception. All this began back then. How to connect and how to fool and how to trick and how to do this and how to do that. So anyway, that started off. Small God, big God, ask the small God, he connects the big God. Now when shirk starts, you got to go deeper and deeper in it. Allah in the Quran says, for example, <laughs> وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Now from here they had to go bigger, more and more into shirk. So what he said to the people was, each one of you, 
that are important tribes, you also bring your gods. So each one was bringing the gods to the Kaaba to Allah, and they all started idol worshipping. And if I didn't like your tribe or you didn't like my tribe and you were more powerful, then you take my God and you throw it away and you get another God in there. That's how idol worship started. Then they started the ayah that I read. They started something else thereafter. They started looking at the camels and any camel that gave birth to a female, that gave birth to a female, that gave birth to a female, sometimes up to 10, they would say, okay, this camel is a very special camel. Let this camel go in the name of the idol. So they would let that camel go and that camel will now become a free camel and it will be allowed to sort of walk away and it was untouchable. Now we wonder how cow worship and all these worships come into existence. There is a pattern to it. All these concoctions this individual created too. That is why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said something very very powerful. He says, I saw this man, Amr ibn Amir, in the depths of fire. He was in the fire burning and he was like sort of pulling his intestines while he was in the fire. Why? Because he was one of the first people to introduce idol worship in Hijaz, in Mecca, Medina and places like this. So my brothers and sisters, what is the point here? The point is very, very important. Next week, inshallah, we'll continue talking about the people of Yemen. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said some very beautiful things about the people of Yemen. They were soft people. They were loving people. They are kind people. In fact, even when you meet some of the brothers and sisters from Yemen over here, mashallah, you'll notice there's a special noor about them. Because they have the du'as of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what I want to end off with here is, Shirk is something that we have to really stand against and it's going to creep into our society and creep into us in various forms, in various ways. Like for example, I mentioned before, nowadays you go to weddings and you don't know if it's a Muslim wedding or a Hindu wedding. Why? Because we are taking certain things from them, the throwing of rice. Who in the world throws food? My brothers, think about it. Who in the world throws food? People are dying without food. You have to throw the food a certain way. Some of the people, they have to wear certain things on their foreheads. Why? Because a certain actor and actress wore a certain dot and a certain jewelry thing that looks like a Hindu sign. Where did all this start from? Where did it come from? Evaluate your life. Evaluate the songs that we are playing in some of these uh, weddings. Some of these songs are from people that are saying that have made kalimat e kufr that have created, they, cre they made such statements against Islam. And what we say, but it's my daughter's wedding, you know, it's my daughter's wedding, it's my last daughter. I got to keep her healthy, I got to keep her happy. How can you keep her happy with an aspect of kufr, with an aspect of shirk? This man, I will end off with him, Amr ibn Amr, Amir. He even changed labbaik Allahumma labbaik. People used to say labbaik Allahumma labbaik, la sharika la labbaik, inna la all these things. He said labbaik, yes he left that. La sharika la labbaik, yes we don't bring anything close to Allah to worship Allah except what Allah wants us to worship with him. Look at how smart he was. Same words, but what he says we will not worship anything except what Allah wants us to worship and we will only bring what Allah wants us to bring to worship with Him. How smart He was. This is how shirk does its work. It makes religion and non-religion go together to mess with our brains and thereafter we say, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless this, may Allah bless that. So inshallah next week we'll continue talking about this but from now to next week let us focus on one very important thing. Just like this man brought shirk to Mecca and Medina, Mecca to Makarramah, the Hijaz, etc. We have to ask ourselves, what shirk are we bringing in our families? What all these crazy ideas we are bringing under the name of Rasul wasallam into our families? This is a given month of Muharram. And this is what we are doing with our lives. And I'm not here to criticize anyone here. But we have to ask ourselves one very important question. Very important, as I end with this note. When I do something, did Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do that? So the homework until next week, inshallah, is reflecting upon 
what are we bringing into our lives? Number one. Number two, when things are here, we have to ask ourselves, how much is it connected to our Rasul sallallahu ta'ala wa sallam? The more we are able to answer this, inshallah, the more benefit we'll get in becoming, inshallah, hopefully a better group of people.